Is KOTOR the best Star Wars game? Well, let's find out on this review of KOTOR. <laughs> KOTOR is a party-based RPG game from 2003. Why am I talking about this game? Well, I recently finished KOTOR for the fifth time, and this had me thinking, why do I keep coming back to play this game? I've already played it five times now, surely I can play another game. Well, I could, but I'd rather explain to you why this game is so good, and why it is one of the best Star Wars games, and maybe one of the best RPGs I've ever played. So to start off with, I'm going to break things down into five parts. Story, gameplay, visuals, music, nostalgia. So with all that laid out, let's get into the good, the bad, and the ugly of KOTOR. Well, and potentially, there are spoilers. Story. The story in KOTOR is the heart of what makes KOTOR so exciting to play. It may seem like a classic Star Wars story, but there is more behind this sinister tale. Starting off with the classical explosive battle scene, and then stopping the big bad guy from using their super weapon seems like the classical formula but allowing the player to form their final path into the resolution of the game makes the story that little bit more appealing. So what makes KOTOR so great? Well, as they say, it's not the destination, but the journey there. The plot. The plot of the game is mostly generic, but you can warp the story to your playstyle. There is a big bad dude, he shows you the power he controls, wig off in search of something to stop or hinder him. Though there is a catch. In the middle of his story, there is a huge revelation that shocked my little 12 year old brain. It was such an awesome moment in the game that I wish I could go back and live that moment anew. Now if you have a big brain, you could probably work out the plot detail beforehand, especially if you have been told there is a shocking plot twist. It's like the Fight Club movie. For years I was told to watch the movie because there was a very interesting plot twist in the middle of the movie. So I spent the first 30 minutes trying to figure it out. You need to go into the video game blind to truly appreciate it. After the shocking plot twist, the game continues down its path of stopping the big bad dude from activating its super weapon. And it's up to you to choose if you want to act on the shocking discovery that is laid out to you. Story choices. The choices in this game are pretty black and white, or light and dark if we are comparing it to the Star Wars alignment. You can kind of follow a grey moral ground, but you'll eventually hit some snags where you have to make a moral choice that leans in one direction. This is due to the game being written to be focused on light versus dark, and not like KOTOR 2 which emphasises neutral choices as all choices have consequences, whether they are morally correct or not. I think this is a good choice for an entry level player into a series, as it makes it easier to understand the consequences of your action. An example is on the water world of Manan. There is an underwater beast there, blocking the passage to a vital location. To move it away from this vital location, you can blow up the machinery that is disturbing it, or poison the water near it so that it dies. Blowing up the machinery doesn't kill any animals, but it stops the mining of Kolto. If you poison the water, it kills the animals and infects the Kolto, and you get banished from Nan. It is obvious destroying the machinery is the morally correct choice, but it still has consequences. Nevertheless, the choices in KOTOR are often interesting and at minimum bi-directional path to tackling problems in the game. I would say this is one of the few games that handled the consequences of actions quite well, as it makes you feel like you've actually done something wrong, or even right. This enhances the story, as you feel like you have control of the outcome of the game. Story, the characters. Through your journey throughout the galaxy, you will encounter several companions that will help you on your journey. They all have their own backstory, motives, and alignment. These companions will comment on your actions, approving and disapproving your choices, based on their own personal beliefs. Stealing from a poor woman, whose husband just died? You can be sure Bastila will interject to stop you from doing it. Killing Sam people mercilessly? HK47 has your back, 
and he's going to encourage you to kill more meat bags. In some cases, companions may even want to stop and talk to you about it. They may try and better your ways if you're going down the dark path or keep encouraging you to do what you're doing. Because each companion has their own backstory, they also have their own side quests. These side quests really help flesh out the companions, as they usually go into detail as to what that character was doing before they met you. An example is helping Bastilla da tracking down her father and learning she doesn't have a really good relationship with her mother, or helping Mission save her brother who left her on a planet all by herself when she was a young teenager. It makes the characters more believable and allows you to get lost in the lore of the world. KOTOR excels in bringing forth interesting characters to help you on your quest. They provide interesting dialogue to help form decisions on what you believe is the right path throughout the game, as every choice may not be completely black and white. Gameplay, building a character. The gameplay can be hit and miss for some people. For me, I thought it was an interesting and unique part to the Star Wars universe. KOTOR uses a D&D like system for its gameplay, which adds an interesting complexity which also shows the versatility of the D&D system. Stats, feats, classes, player saves and force abilities all have their D&D equivalent in the medieval fantasy. Even choosing a Jedi class is the same as dual classing in D&D. Let's start by looking at the main character. When you start the game, you mold the character into what you like to play. Your first choice is your class. This will decide how much health you'll have, feats you will automatically obtain, and skills available. Attributes is the next big choice you'll make. These will affect the character heavily, and will decide the general playstyle of your character. The attributes you can select are Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Charisma, and Wisdom. These have varying effects, but the general idea is Strength and Dexterity determine melee damage, Constitution will help boost your vitality, Intelligence determines how skillful you are, and Wisdom and Charisma will boost your force power effectiveness. The game gives you just enough stats to be above average in two or three of these attributes. Later in the game, your character can dual class into one of the Jedi classes. These being Guardian, Sentinel, and Counselor. All play slightly differently and have varying hidden bonus effects, like Guardians being able to force jump into combat. With dual classing and different stat lines and skills, the game allows you to make a variety of builds like a strength based dark side guardian or a charisma focused light sour counselor, or maybe even a neutral sneaking dexterous sentinel. Maybe you don't even want to be a Jedi. Well, you can do a blaster only run if you wanted to. On the note of dark side and light side, I mentioned before that characters will comment on your actions. These are usually at moments where your character has shifted alignment slightly. This is due to the game implementing a dark side or light side system, where if you do acts of kindness and compassion, you'll get light side points. Where you do acts of anger and selfishness, you'll get dark side points. Alignment changes the way people interact with you and the approval of your companions. KOTOR allows you to build a character of differing strengths and abilities, which helps with replayability of the game, as a light side guardian is going to have a different story and playstyle compared to a dark side counselor. Gameplay, combat. Combat in KOTOR is real time and turn based. When you attack an enemy, you will initiate combat and complete your turn of combat. The enemy will then have their opportunity to attack you back. You will have to wait for their combat step to be completed before you can attack again. With each attack made against you, you have a chance to evade the attack. There is no damage mitigation in the game, only chance to evade. During your attack phase, you can attack multiple times against an enemy if you choose the right feats, weapons and force powers. Just by using two weapons, you are able to make two attack rolls against an enemy. With that though, you will have a lower chance to hit. So it's up to you whether you want to get as many attacks in as possible, or just hit as hard as you can with one solid hit. Combat is different in two halves of the game. I split these into pre-Jedi phase and post-Jedi phase. With the pre-Jedi phase, you can rely only on your base class feats, skills and abilities, which is harder and much more limiting compared to the post-Jedi combat. Grenades become your crowd clearing ability and stimulants are your buffs to swing hard and run faster. 
You are relying on your team a fair bit more in the early game. Many enemies can prove to be deadly if you get overwhelmed. Once you do class into a Jedi, you will earn your Jedi Force powers and Jedi focused feats. You will notice a considerable difference in the way you play. You will be slinging Force powers, buffing your party with powerful Force abilities. You will become much more of a powerhouse, being able to tank whole rooms of enemies and blast them down with Force powers. If you are rolling a Force focused character, this will be the point in the game where the potential of your character will truly be unlocked. In the end, the combat may not be everyone's flavour, but I think the flexibility of all the tools the game has to offer and the awesome force powers you can throw out, the game provides an interesting and engaging experience that any RPG lover will surely enjoy. Visuals, Graphics For a game from 2003, the graphics are pretty decent for the era. It was in the period of time where 3D games were really starting to get graphically overhauled. It was released around the same time as its brother game, Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy, and Prince of Persia Sands of Time. All are third person games, and I would say KOTOR is on par with the other two. Prince of Persia might have a slight edge on KOTOR, but it's still fairly close. Does KOTOR hold up well compared to the modern games? Uh, no, but the game is still fine to look at. The attention to detail is obvious in certain areas and lacking in others. Like generic background NPCs are usually quite blocky and downright look shit. Most of the companions are pretty swaggin' though. Bastila has probably one of the best looking faces in the game. Right off the Malak, of course. And if you look at the rest of the main cast, they all hold up quite well. Karth, Mission, Candorous all have well textured faces. The visuals, aesthetic, and theme. KOTOR is set in a sci-fi fantasy world of Star Wars. The theme of the game plays an important role in driving the plot, lore, and visuals. If you started this game with no information that it was a Star Wars game, how long do you think it would take for someone to find out if it was a Star Wars game? KOTOR really starts off quite differently, and the art direction was similar but slightly different. This was intentional of course, because they really wanted to make sure the games had no hard links to the original saga, as they didn't want it to affect the main lore. Still, when you're on Taurus, you get a similar feeling to Coruscant. Tall skyscrapers, with sprawling city, moving through each world in the game, you definitely get the sense you are in the Star Wars universe. The vast expanses of Tatooine Desert, the dark and murky depths of Manan, the lush land of Kashyyyk, each have their own uniqueness with similarities to the parent product, Star Wars. Now, if you knew KOTOR was a Star Wars game, you would be expecting a lot of familiar things. Smugglers, bounty hunters, troopers, starships, droids, blasters, and sword-wielding space wizards to name a few things. KOTOR doesn't hold back on any of these elements. KOTOR adds all of this and much, much more, which leads to a game that is familiar but still just as different. Music While the music in KOTOR isn't groundbreaking like John Williams' soundtrack in the original saga, it is still an enjoyable piece to the game that serves well as an addition. It doesn't distract the player from the duty of playing the game, which is what makes an interesting and good soundtrack. Every piece conveys emotions for where and what you are doing. Listen to Kashyyyk's music. What does this music convey to you? That this is a natural planet with a tribe of natives. What about this? This is the music you hear whenever Malik is in frame. The game is trying to tell you that this guy is bad and you should feel his powerful presence. If you were looking for a piece of John Williams music, it can actually be found at the start and end of the game. Disney might demonetize me or put a copyright claim on this video which I don't really want, so maybe pretend with your ears. It really helps set the tone by having the John Williams soundtrack at the start of the game. And helps prove the point that you may get a movie-like experience. Nostalgia Nostalgia is like crack. 
Once you get a whiff of it, you want to go back and relive those awesome moments. There is no short shortage of that for me when I'm playing KOTOR. There are so many elements of this game that generate an engaging experience. I would say this has made me develop a general bias for the game, but I believe it is well deserved for this piece of art. Hell, I think this game is one of the best RPGs today. It has all the elements an RPG fan could want and doesn't have boring open world environments with petty tasks of finding 100 flags on a map. Okay, so let's just wrap things up. KOTOR is definitely a good game, and holds up to today's standards. It has characters with interesting stories and varying character builds for replayability. The gameplay has its ups and downs and may not be enjoyed by all people, but it is still challenging and engaging. KOTOR may have average graphics compared to modern standards, but it still pulls through with a good aesthetic. Does it beat a game like Dragon Age Inquisition or Mass Effect Andromeda? That's a solid yes for me. Does it beat out Divinity Original Sin 2 or Witcher 3? Now that's a little bit of a tough question, but that's for an entire another video I think. KOTOR isn't the most stunning looking, gameplay intense, boss flying, battle royale game, but it is still one of the most loved and enjoyed games by me. And if you are questioning what you want to play next, KOTOR should be definitely at the top of your list. Thank you for watching folks. If you got this far, drop a comment, let me know what you thought, throw me a like, and thanks for watching.